We're going to learn how to create scatter plots. Scatter plots are used to compare two quantitative variables. Let's re start by reviewing how to plot a point in the Cartesian plane. This is your x-axis and this is your y-axis. When you plot a point, you always want to move left to right and then up to down. So for example, if I wanted to plot the point 2, 4, I would move two units in the x direction and four units in the y direction. Or if I wanted to plot the point negative three, negative four, I would move three units in the negative x direction and three units in the negative y direction and plot the point. For example, the data set below compares the amount of time in hours students spend on social media in a week to a student's average GPA. The first thing I would like us to do is plot the data. Let's start by setting up a set of axes. Along the x-axis, I put in our time and hours ranging from 0 to 7. And along the y-axis, I'll put in the GPA. I put a break in the graph between 0 and 2.5, and from there I ran on a scale of 0.25s. Now we'll plot the ordered pairs. At time 0, the average GPA was 3.91. At time 1, the average GPA was 3.79. So I've plotted out all the ordered pairs. If you notice, they seem to fall in a perfectly straight line, which makes us ask the question, would you expect the exact same outcome to always occur? For example, in Part B, would you expect that all students who spend three hours on social media per week to have a GPA of 3.54? And the answer is obviously no there will be variation. For instance, some values will lie above 3 and some values will lie below 3. And the idea is that if you were to average all of these GPAs, you would, could form a line that runs through the center or the average of them. So when we're used to plotting lines in math, we're used to seeing one output for each input, but in statistics, for each particular input, let's say three, there can be several outputs. And in statistics, it's our goal to figure out what the average output is so we can make a prediction. When working in these problems, we'll need to identify our two quantitative variables. The independent, also called explanatory variable or predictor variable, is the variable that goes along the horizontal axis. We often denote it by an x. The value of this variable can be used to predict the dependent or the response variable which goes along the vertical axis. We often denote this by a y. A saying I like to use to help me remember how to determine which one is dependent and which one is independent is y depends on x. The dependent variable depends on the independent variable. For example, determine the independent and dependent variables in each setting annual earnings of full-time workers, and number of years in college. So I say to myself, do numbers of year in college depend on how much money you earn, or is it the other way around? Does the annual earning of a full-time worker depend on the amount of years they spent in college? And this is the one that makes more sense. So here we can say annual earnings of full-time workers is our dependent variable, and number of years in college is our independent variable. Here's another example. Would outside temperature depend on the productivity of a construction worker? Or would it be the other way around? Would the productivity of a construction worker depend on the outside temperature? If we think about it, if it's hot outside, someone's probably not likely to work as much. Or if it's extremely cold, you may not work as much. But if the temperature is very nice and pleasant, you're probably going to be pretty productive. So in this case, we will say outside temperature is the independent variable and productivity is the dependent variable. We're going to learn how to interpret a scatter plot now. The five things you need to look for are strength, form, direction, context, and then any additional comments on outliers, influential observations, and clustering. The direction of a scatter plot mainly determines whether the scatter plot is overall increasing, positive direction. You could almost think positive slope here. Large values of x 
correspond with large values of y. That would be positive. You could think of it in the reverse. Small values of x correspond with small values of y. Those would be down here. If the scatter plot has an overall negative direction, then it's going to run like this. And what you will see is that small values of x correspond with very large values on y, whereas very large values of x would correspond with very small values of y. You could think a negative slope in this case. The strength of the scatter plot mainly summarizes how close together or far the way the points are from each other. What we're trying to say is do overall they move together or do they move independent of one another? If there's no association, when x increases, you cannot tell whether or not y will increase or decrease. So there's just a random scattering of points. When there's a weak association, the points will be far apart from one another, but you can tell an overall direction. In this case, overall direction is positive, but the points are pretty spread out. Just to contrast, in a strong association, the points would be very, very close together. And if you were to think of banding them, and when I say band, you're imagining a, fitting a, a circle around these and seeing if it's a small or a large circle. In this case, this is a fairly small circle, whereas in the weak association, it's a fairly large circle. So the closer the points are, the stronger the association. The more spread out, the weaker the association. A moderately weak or moderately strong association would be somewhere in between here. So something like this, kind of halfway between weak and strong. We also want to state context when interpreting scatter plots. Context means to say the independent variable, remember that's x, in words, and to say the dependent variable, remember that's y, in words. And then connect these using words such as associated, relationship, or correlated. So we could say something like y and x are associated, or y ha has a relationship with x, or x and y are correlated with one another remembering to substitute the words that x and y represent. The form of a scatter plot can be linear. This one would be linear with a positive slope, and this one would be linear with a negative slope. It can also be nonlinear, shapes such as these. Just to go through some of your nonlinear shapes, if you were to think of trying to band these shapes, this one would have almost an exponential shape. This one would have an overall parabolic shape. This one would be more of a logistic shape. In this class, we're mainly going to be looking at our linear functions, and we'll mainly either be saying it's linear or not linear. The last case we can look at is no relation, which again would look like a very weak or no association. Here, as x increases, you cannot tell whether y will increase or decrease. There's no relationship between these two. The last thing that we need to look for are clustering outliers and influential observation. Clustering looks like this. There will be a group down here and a group up here. This is clustering in a positive direction. The other option is a group up here and a group down here. This would be clustering in a negative direction. Then there's outliers and influential observations. If your scatter plot moves like this, and you have a dot up here all by itself, this would be what we call an outlier. It's very extreme direction, but it occurs in the y value of the scatter plot. So you're thinking there's a large gap in here. An influential observation would occur when your scatter plot is doing this and you have a point all by itself down here. If you were to draw a line through these points, do you see that this value right here would affect the overall slope of the line and it would pull the line this way? So you could think of an op influential observation as an observation that affects the slope of a line fitting through the points. Whereas if you were fitting a line through this one, this point kind of fits with these values. It's not going in the opposite direction. As the x's increase, this y value increased. 
on this one it went in the opposite direction. As the x increased, the y decreased. So if it's kind of following the overall trend, but just a very extreme value, that's an outlier. If it's going against the overall trend and it's an extreme value, that's an influential observation. Let's practice interpreting a scatter plot. There's five things we need to look for, and the first of the five is strength. To decide the strength of the scatter plot, form a band around the points, and then decide whether this band is fairly narrow or wide. Here, this oval seems to be pretty narrow, which means that the relationship is strong. The next thing we need to look at is form. In this case, the points seem to fall along a line, so the form would be linear. However, there is one value that's not following the overall trend, and we'll get to that later. The next thing we need to talk about is direction. And we're asking ourselves, positive or negative? Are the values increasing or decreasing? Here, the overall direction is negative because it's a decreasing pattern. And then lastly, context. We need to say in words that this scatter plot compares the age of a vehicle with the value of the vehicle. Let's put these four things together in a sentence. Right now, we can say there is a strong, negative, linear relationship between the age of a vehicle and the value of a vehicle. Notice I used one of our connecting words to join the independent and dependent variable. Here I chose the word relationship. You could have also said association or correlation. Now there's four things to check for, strength, form, direction, and context. The fifth item that we need to check for are outliers, influential observations, and clustering. Now in this case, I said that there was a value that didn't quite follow the overall trend of the data. Let's go ahead and discuss this value. Right here, we have a point. And if you notice, this point goes against the overall trend. For most of them, as x gets bigger, y gets smaller. But for this particular point, as x was small, y was small. It's going against the overall trend. That would make this one an influential observation. So I've made the comment there is an influential observation. What would be ideal is to say a very small value of x, a vehicle that was not very old, sold for an unusually low price. Let's try another example. This chart correlates life expectancy and number of children per woman for each country in the world. The bubbles are sized by population and colored by region. One of the things I'll tell you is that over time, most countries have moved to the bottom right corner of this chart. What we're seeing here is that people are living longer lives with lower fertility rates. Let's go ahead and interpret this particular scatter plot using our five items. The first one would be strength. So I'm going to band these points and then ask myself, does this appear to be a wide band or a narrow band? And then this one, it looks somewhere in between. Let's call this moderately strong. Strength, then comes form. I hope we all agree that this looks linear. We could think of fitting a straight line here. Next is direction. As life expectancy is increasing, fertility rate is decreasing. That makes this a negative direction. And then lastly, context. If we look, x represents life expectancy and y represents fertility rate. So we'll need to say these in a sentence. Let's put all of this together. Putting this together, we can say there is a moderately strong, negative, linear relationship between life expectancy and fertility rate. 
The last thing we should check for are outliers, influential observations, or clustering. Looking at this particular graph, none of those issues exist, so we'll leave our interpretation as is. Here's another example. Consider the relationship between crime rate and education level. Let's interpret the scatter plot. Banding the points, let's discuss strength. This band looks moderately strong. The form here appears to be linear. You could think of fitting a straight line through these values. The direction would be positive. As education level increases, crime rate increases. And then there's context. We need to make sure that we mention that X stands for education level and Y stands for the, the crime rate. Let's put this together in a sentence. Putting this together, we can say there is a moderately strong, positive, linear relationship between education level and crime rate. But what I would like to ask you is, does this interpretation seem logical? Does it make sense that someone with a higher level of education would be afflicted by a higher crime rate? Wouldn't you think that the more educated you are, the less crime you would experience in your life? So to us, this doesn't quite seem logical. Is there something else going on here? Let's dig a little deeper. Let's consider a lurking variable such as urbanization. And we'll consider three different levels. This is urbanization level equal zero, level equal 50, and level equal 100. Let's use this information to modify our interpretation of the scatter plot. Let's come into a fixed level of urbanization. Let's say that we fix it at level 100 and then interpret these particular sets of points. Looking within here, do you see that the overall relationship changes to being negative? So it's still linear, still strong, but the direction changed to negative. Same thing if you fix it at 50. Still pretty strong, but negative. And exact same thing at zero. Strong, linear, but negative. So for each fixed level of urbanization, the relationship between the education level and crime rate reversed. Let's put this in a sentence. Controlling for urbanization the crime rate has a negative association with education level. This is called Simpson's Paradox. Originally, the association, without looking at the clustering, was positive. But when you come in and examine the clusterings, the overall relationship changed. It reversed. It went to being negative at fixed values of the lurking variable. So the association between two variables reverses when a third variable is introduced. Here's the work cited used in this lecture.